Right, so welcome everyone for Cloud Computing and Big Data Lecture 8, Infrastructure as a Service in our second part. Now we talk about advanced infrastructure as a service topics and applications. And in the first part of the lecture, really reflected on many of the fundamentals of infrastructure as a service, which were in one way or another already implemented, used in, in all the different lectures we had before. So we touch base on virtualization lecture four, we basically also discussed the idea of EC2 cloud systems, which are elastic, growing with the need that we had, basically also in terms of uh, elastic MapReduce. Or we also said the AMI images, which have already pre-packaged deep learning packages for you, uh, which is usually a very cumbersome topic to install all of those, right? PyTorch is TensorFlows with the right versions of Nickels, and all these libraries have to fit to each other. In the advanced um, topics now from infrastructure as a service, we will you know, go here and there in more details in selected topics. Of course, I cannot put all topics here. And one of the topics we didn't touch so much directly was this kind of uh, storage area. And uh, basically here I show you a little bit of video of Burn Global. Um, you can see, of course, that also Iceland has many of these players on board. Yeah. yeah. Let's do this. So in the end, um, please have a look on the video just to see a little bit the connectivity. Um, my hope is that we can visit there, um, essentially. And also, when you think about this infrastructure as a service topic, which is now the advanced idea in this, think about the carbon footprint in this. You have a large data center, and you see here with what they actually basically do their marketing here in Iceland with 100% renewable energy, right? So you have water, you have ambient air cooling because Iceland tends to be much more colder than in the desert of the state somewhere. So all of this is factored in, in of course, this infrastructure topic. Even if your company is somewhere else, it maybe it still makes sense to do the infrastructure use here, um, basically in Iceland. And that's why we have a growing data center, uh, a growing amount of data centers. What I miss out here, for instance, is a Borealis data center in Blendos, right? They are very, very efficient because they are not only in the north, right of the country they're also directly at a power plant in Blundos and uh, this is would be a bit too far to drive for our exchange students so this takes quite some time to go to Blundos it's in the north but still uh, something to consider which is of course now a really hot topic in Iceland we just signed an MOU at the Arctic Assembly for a new data center we were going to build uh, basically in Blundos uh, with the Reykjavik Institute hopefully uh, joining forces from the University of Reykjavik, University of Iceland, Business Iceland, and so forth. So it was a lot in the media. But you see also lots of things are happening in Iceland, and that's what I wanted to say on the one hand. Now, and this reflects storage, this reflects um, computing, um, of course, needs mostly, and also some of these services they offer. You see here the, the HPC flow, which is this kind of EIS cluster that already is a clustered version of all your different hardware which is of course also now questionable. Is that maybe already a platform or is it the infrastructure? Hard to say for some it's infrastructure as a service. Some others would say it's a platform as a service. So if you search for it in Iceland, there's lots of things happening. We also work that there are more and more jobs in this area. Basically some of them have the, let's say side effect that for instance in Bern Global, there are lots of jobs in the UK. And basically what they have here in Iceland is just a, let's say smaller crew close to Keflavik. But uh, some of the discussions we had, for instance, with the Verialis Data Center and the guys from the Reykjavik Institute we're going to create is that we also want to have a very strong workforce in Iceland. And here goes the marketing, just to talk to you that, of course, here um, in Iceland, a lot of things happening there. When we now move a little bit to storage, um, one of the very most famous systems you already heard from is this, let's say, object storage, um, the so-called storage as a service, S3. And you will find today almost all cloud computing services from all different vendors actually provide in one way or another an S3 interface. So in a way you would say even it's a community de facto standard, although the word standard could be misleading because it's from a company, right? You have to be careful. It's a proprietary interface, not an open standard, but as Amazon is so much used for storage in this object storage area. And the, the difference is really that you just have more or less a bucket. You don't really, know any more in which of these different, let's say, physical storages you have in which hard disk 
this is basically stored and you don't want to know, right? When we use grade scope, the idea, where's our exam? It doesn't mean anything to us. For us, it's just important that the exam is, you know, together with the Kenny Tala key, maybe the real right one you want to see for a student. Where this is lying, if it is in, you know, basically somewhere on the East Coast or somewhere on the West Coast in US, we don't care. We just use grade scope as a service, right? And it's using this bit, this kind of interesting bucket idea to, to a lot of degree as many others, Spotify and so on as well. That provide different interfaces so that even also application developers could directly access this storage, which is also a key element in this. Uh, think again, grade scope has the specific calls to get the exam at the right time into your grade scope for basically looking at it. And this is something which of course has stand now the test of time and what the cloud providers then on top of you basically provide you on top of that is these kind of different elements, right? It's really scalable. So no matter how big your MP3 collection is and will be extended by more and more, let's say elements, you can always scale up. Of course, you have to pay the price for it sometime because it's also active storage. We come to that in a moment, what it means to be rather archived. You can also say that they give you lots of certainties, right, for this. So essentially saying when you put the exams in, they will be never lost. Probably it's 99.9. .9. There's not 100% in data center business. There's always a missing percentage uh, to account for problems you don't see. Uh, the security we discussed is, of course, a very important topic, maybe just not only for the exams, but also for medical applications, for many business applications. And the easy migration is now the interesting thing that S3 is really a standard interface or de facto standard interface. So here the data is not so much trapped that then using higher level services like SageMaker from Amazon. Here it's really possible to get relatively quickly the data out, right? So in this sense, the migration to other platforms is still feasible and possible with the S3 interface. Now, when you want to have an idea how that is used, um, basically just hosting a static website where you want to be sure that it's always automatically backed up, that it's 99% you know, reachable. You have here one application that can really use you know, Amazon S3 directly very quickly and you pull it together with different other services, what they have. There's an Amazon CloudFront where you can have a specific URL for your website created. And then this kind of scalable domain name system um, where you combine this now to, of course, the DNS system so that you basically are findable in the cloud and so on. And by this, you very quickly, let's say even in, in five minutes, have a website up and running, right? So this is one, one interesting element. And of course, Amazon S3 is here providing the storage in the background and can, of course, now scale whatever you do in the cloud. If you have people uploading Volcano photos, and basically can you know have a business out of this that people can buy, contribute, and also share, or basically sell their photos, you have to have an infrastructure that scales because you don't know in the beginning how many will use your service, right? So maybe in summer, there were lots of visitors, so you have to basically add lots of them. And now basically you don't really have a very much increase anymore because it seemed to be relatively silent now, the volcano. So then you don't need to have much, much more hardware, suddenly you kind of stagnate in the performance needs. And this is where S3 is just good in, right? It's scalable if you need it, but it's also be, you know, just there for you with your normal storage. And you don't pay extra for this availability of the scalability. So it's just, you know, then of course you can use it um, with a so-called, um, yeah, console area where you basically then have all your websites and can add, you know, cascading style sheets, JavaScripts, and so on. So in a way, you have a really powerful web server as an infrastructure, and now you can develop it for your own websites, whatever you want to do, by using really relatively normal HTML code, JavaScript codes, and so on. And you can also do upload and download content relatively straightforward because this S3 is really HTTP. So basically many people and many devices will support this in order to create your own you know, web server with uploads and downloads. Admittedly, a very trivial um, example, I just show you some other elements where of course this is a very important part. Um, S3 is now uh, basically this active part in it, but there's also this glacier that we discussed here in the break. It was a good question, what's the difference? You have to think about that usually data needs to be really accessible all the time if you want to use it. That means if you click on an MP3 to be played, it should be playing, right? So if you do this with normal S3, that works relatively well because they're active disks. 
But if you have something on in this S3 glacier, this is an archive. It's stored on tapes, right? Tapes are very cheap and they have an, an enormous capacity. But if you then click on an MP3, it doesn't work, right? It will migrate slowly, slowly, slowly to active disks and then will play, right? So it's a complete different service, let's say portfolio. So in a way, the name Glacier says that you put something in the Glacier for long-term storage, for long-term archiving. It will be put on tape archives. And of course, then when you combine the different storages, you see here, you go from 0.004 cents, yeah, very little per gigabyte. Uh, and when you then do even Glacier Deep Archive, that's maybe very deep in Langjökul inside, then you have 0 0.00099 per gigabyte. So you see with this, of course, you're very quickly in, in price ratios where it makes sense maybe to duplicate or backup your data in the cloud. But it also means that it's not so easy to always get directly accessing it. And, you know, when you think about the transfer, however, you can imagine when you go into the glacier deep, you know, in Langjökul, this might be very costly. If you see here, unfortunately, the in-house audience cannot see this. If you have the S3 standard access for this, this is the API you would use in a so-called representational state transfer or REST interface, where you use HTTP with HTTP GET, POST, PUT, DELETE for modifying data. And, and you go there and pay the price for it because now everything is in reverse. Here, S3 is very cheap by each API call. Every time you get a GET exam, right, you have to pay. And Gradescope is paying to Amazon, each API call. Now, in S3 standards, it's extremely cheap because it's are active disks. There's nothing to, you know, wait for. But if you do an, an S3 glacier, you know, you see the prices are extremely higher because here, of course, lots of effort has to be made now to migrate the data from the glacier to the active disk to make it available to be used quickly. And this is the difference between, you know, several of these storage variants where you have to be very careful of using them properly. The, the glacier family really makes only sense if you're something for long-term archiving. Maybe the exams, let's say from the last 10 years, uh, you put there basically in this glacier and the exam that you have, of course, now in the active course, you would put rather in S3 just to have an analogy. And there are other elements when you come back to our ideas where we used basically things before. There are also this elastic block storage um, where you have, let's say another philosophy, not object storage, block storage is a little bit like, you know, the file system, which we also have used and where you can basically then also scale up with the volume you need. And this is EBS, you, as the name suggests, can also scale higher and higher and basically allows you, of course, to, to use it with your compute, because in the end, in your cloud, you have to have a storage, right? Either it's S3 or there's an elastic block storage, which is more or less like a file system a bit. You have to have some storage, only compute in EC2, then, you know, where should be your data lying that you put as an input or an output? And with this, basically, you're always bound to one of these, basically, EFS, EBS, or basically the S3 systems. And they're always um, basically a little bit different in the usage. As I said, it's not an object storage. So here you're not like having a key value pair to get the data back. Here you have, let's say, so-called volumes and more, let's say, a mounting to this different computing, like you would do also partly in the file system. And it looks a little bit like a hard drive, really, if you want. Now, going one step more, um, you would say um, where you just play with mostly blocks in the EBS and the hard drive you mount. Um, of course, once you do this, you also want to maybe go one step further and have more a file-based character. Now, interestingly enough, that is vanishing more and more these days because people use apps and in apps, you don't really have this identity of a file anymore. You have just apps and they have their data, right? But here it's of course also something where you can have um, the Elastic file system really working as if you would do it on your own laptop with your file system. For some of you that using, you know, Windows or Linux and already knowing, still doing this on the laptops with moving files. So then they know what I mean with this. If you're on the iPhone world, it's maybe basically your iPad world is something which is almost vanishing there, but still underneath it's still existing, right? It's just built on top. Um, you still have the file systems, but you don't see it. It's abstracted away from the apps. 
and the different, let's say, um, benefits with this as well, and um, essentially different versions of frequent access or infrequent access. And of course, again, different pricing model examples. So everywhere you can go to the website and see the actual pricing that is just now basically happening in all the different regions it was also a question in the break. So yes, you can really have this different, let's say, choosing of options for what you want to have for your clouds. And you always see basically the pricing on these websites. And of course, they're constantly updated as well. So these are three different types of storages um, now for completely different purposes, just to give you some examples where some of these infrastructures as a service things are needed. And also to give you an example that of course now, as you have this as a base, this infrastructure as a service, you can build a marketplace. You can say, people maybe use this for many different applications, right? So when you think about um, how Spotify is using or Airbnb is using for completely different elements, they still build on the same services from Amazon EC2. They do load balancing with this and then using MapReduce to really analyze data. Um, while basically then Spotify has lots of it in the MS, Amazon S3. Um, but however, many of the popular categories will be very similar elements. They have to access the S3, maybe with some certain specific software tool. And one of the examples would be maybe a Hadoop entity that already is pre-configured, like done by Airbnb, right? But is basically pre-configured and is available in the marketplace by a third-party vendor. So also other people make, let's say, money or share their um, idea how to use the infrastructure um, basically with this AWS marketplace, where it's a really community building exercise to really um, get, you know, lots of people also towards the AWS services. Hence, AWS is really nicely supporting this idea, of course, where you can search for many different categories uh, where people which are in the same shoes maybe as you, right, had already some problems and have some pre-configured services. Security is one highlight. Maybe you want to have a very secure server. You can look it up and see in the marketplace who has already done something like this, pre-configured good router setups, pre-configured this, and then you have the images. Basically, you can take and are available from other users, so to speak. It's a user-to-user -user, uh, connection rather than AWS to users. And I think that's that's a very good example. And of course, the idea of a marketplace is copied in almost all clouds as best as possible. But it also means, of course, you have to give certain you know credits to the people creating it. You have to have a certain quality check on these things, which is also very important. Then again, pointing maybe on the uh, idea of security, um, people could be um, you know a bit thinking, okay, infrastructure as a service is nice. Um, why people don't adopt it. Of course, you always have to see the physical infrastructure is still in US, is in China or is Alibaba somewhere else. You give away the data, right? Even if you have 99% guarantees that the data will be not lost, it's in the hands of other governments. And other governments have here the right, here and there, for instance, US, they can look into the data if they want. Now think about Volkswagen, creating a very new design as a, you know, more German or was a German manufacturer, I'm not sure anymore, but basically, you know, having a new interesting design of a car and it's basically exposed in the clouds that others may could look into this. Of course, it's always under the government regime, usually in terms of checking for illegal behavior and so on, of course, but people can look into this, right? Long story short, administrators on the other side of the Atlantic, they have access to this data if they do something with it or not, you will never know, right? Of course, you assume that will be not the case, but it's something what you can never be sure about. Hence, people want to maybe do their own infrastructure as a service in-house. And that's here one of the examples where I want to just point to an, a subsequent lecture coming in lecture 13, where basically you put in the other shoes of a user. Basically here we are in the situation that your boss comes to you and said, I want to do infrastructure as a service in my company and we want to do it on site. So you basically now need all this cloud operating system aspects, how I do really access storage, how do I provide a virtualized compute entity? I want to have all of these Lego, let's say components ready to deploy it in-house inside Volkswagen and of course, then I also want to be interoperable with AWS in terms as a peak time or when I really need it for some certain small applications. And this will be the role of the so-called OpenStack. 
you can see it as a kind of Lego box to create your own infrastructure, which is not the physical layer I'm talking about. You still have to buy the CPUs. You have to buy the GPUs, the memory network, the clusters. But the way how you then offer it to your company is already, let's say, preset with all the different OpenStack services. And we will have a complete lecture based on it. It's quite a community standard today, how you create, so to speak, your own cloud in these different fields. And it even reaches into a platform as a service, right? It's not only infrastructure as a service, um, parts in it. So NetApp is very similar also with this. You have basically a third party provider um, with different infrastructure. You see here, um, which is a kind of neutrality uh, idea that you don't really are bound into a specific vector lock, as we will call it, from the main hyperscaler, as they are known in the community, right? Because these uh, the way how you access the services here and there is always very different. So there is a service portfolio of some like NetApp that try to abstract from this. So once you deal with NetApp, they will basically try to make an easy migration to all of this, work with all of these different clouds and build an abstraction layer for you so that they can claim to you, no matter how much AWS is changing in the future, you don't worry because we are interoperable with all of those. So it's a kind of niche market, um, putting a layer again on over these cloud systems. And of course, claim then also with an easy migration. From practical experience, we know that S3 in the past with AWS was often changing. So it was also not easy for these, let's say, cloud vendors, which are a little bit in the middle to keep track of this. So it's a interesting niche market to, to say we're still using the infrastructure provided by the big ones. But I tried to do it in a way that it's, you know, I can abstract for it. That means for you, you're basically independent of these different companies. Could be a unique selling proposition. Um, by now, I would say these are so well embedded in all of our society. It's also unlikely that they go bankrupt or that they will change totally, right? So that Amazon just says, oh, our shopping is enough. We don't do any more. Let's say AWS is web services. We get a lot of money from our you know, typical Amazon packet business. And 10 years ago, that wasn't so obvious. Today, I guess we will see that maybe they even earn almost more with the web services today than just a little Amazon shopping website. Which is also interesting because they're themselves, they're users with the Amazon package, right? Infrastructure. They needed a very good computing infrastructure to be so good as Amazon is today was delivering a packet today, basically at your front when you call. Um, and of course, by also giving this infrastructure away, they had a very nice idea of making this, let's say as a second um, pillar in the company and have by this, of course, lots of money accumulated in the future and in the past. Um, now the, the idea, what we didn't really touched on in a really low level thinking was when when I'm in the decision maker now and think about clouds, I still always want to see what can I do and where are my differences. We talked about cloud or not cloud in a way, but of course now we have a better understanding that there are different models in that because there are these kind of different service portfolios. So, and if you take basically what we learned a little bit from the MapReduce lecture, just as an example, there is now basically you as a data scientist um, are confronted in a company and says here, you have to do big data. You know, this is our pot of data. This is now given to us. Please, please use it. And now as a data scientist or if for you are responsible in the company, the boss will want from you a MapReduce infrastructure. And you have now to define and say, well, is it cheaper or better to maybe do it on-premise, full custom, right? That means... I can do whatever I want with it, but of course I go the, the price, I have the bare metal inside the company. That means I need experts for hardware that you know are dealing with hardware issues, you know, ch exchanging disks, um, know about the network security, know about configuring them. Of course, it's very flexible. You can almost do everything. You can do your Hadoop cluster as you like or your Apache Spark cluster, but you have to have all the the experts for it to really make this on a level which your company is happy with so that data scientists that really use it don't really deal with a lot of errors all the time that don't want to you know maybe use it then of course you could think about doing it just as a basically um uh yeah just a map reduce appliance that you use 
So here you basically go to a more virtualized setup of saying maybe someone has already provided for us so-called virtual images, right? That are basically, I uh, can just download and then I have several workers and several head nodes working on my cluster. It's already getting more into the virtualized space, still is more on-premise like, right? But here I reuse essentially um, already the appliance done by something else. And we have seen, for instance, Docker images, and we'll see that in future lectures as well. Again, they are provided, or the marketplace gives us already some, let's say, appliances pre-configured for a MapReduce cluster, which enables me some, some form of, you know, going faster to the topic. Still, I have all the overhead maybe of going to basically on-premise installations and so on. And the more you go virtualized, now you could probably see that someone else is maybe, you know, getting, this is the two areas here we're talking about. Someone else is hosting you MapReduce for you, right? And here we're talking about Elastic MapReduce, basically, where here someone else is hosting that for us. And this is exactly the Amazon EMR, right? That is a hosting virtualized for us. And the applications on top of MapReduce, we have to, you know, basically, define we have to organize this map and reduce tasks as we know but we don't care about anything else it's hosted for us we don't need to buy the bare metal everything is there we use ec2 of course here it's also starting with the accumulating costs right in amazon for more workers with high memory while here the cost was more in the real metal and in the people people really so this is a dividing line where you in the company now can have things thinking about um where do you want to be? These are the options you have to really enable these services in a company. And of course, while this sounds very nicely, where MapReduce is maybe just as a service in some nice Jupyter notebook, and you just code shortly map and reduce tasks, which is, let's say, a more added value than having MapReduce hosted, let's say, as a, as a very rudimentary, no GUI, no aspect where you do the computing yourself a little bit to do the MapReduce jobs. Here, this could be the perfect entity, very easy usable, but usually those cost also a lot of money. On the other hand, you go to your boss and say, for that, we don't have to buy any metal, right? And have no people that even have to know about MapReduce, because in these offerings, there will be even service people that clarify that MapReduce is always running 99.9%. .9%, and there also will be an overview or basically an application that takes already care of it, let's say machine learning suite based on Mahout that use the MapReduce infrastructure as a service. So in a way, this is the, the, the two extremes, right? Where you always have to think about, and the interesting thing from practice is also, it's a learning curve in this to really understand where is your company. And secondly, over the period of time, you have to review these decisions, right? Let's say Angry Birds in the beginning, no customers, maybe experimented with a small, my produce cluster here. Overnight, this was bombastic. People wanted to play it, but they couldn't. They don't have the bare metal in-house, right? So the, the game was basically not working for many customers. Now, this is maybe a time when you start your customers increasing exponentially to think, I need someone who is scaling with me. So then maybe the time has been coming for the small startup with almost no users to think about a virtualized solution and now basically thinking about um, that you roll that out on your customers again. Anytime you can buy Angry Birds of $5.99 in the app, one euro or one dollar is going automatically to the hosting, but I'm, I'm secured. When now thousand new users come because a movie, the new Angry Birds movie was in the cinemas yesterday, then I just, I don't have to be worried. I just scale with the infrastructure. No th new thousand users, and basically they pay this one euro anyway, in a way inherently in my cost model for using the cloud. So I scale automatically with the price and the users. And as a CEO of Angry Birds, I can just lie back and wait and see, right? And of course, this is something, a progress you're gonna make through all of these different periods when you have a software and something you have to consider. Right, and yeah, this is essentially let's say one one area of the story um of course data is another one um you can imagine that uh, lots of elements in this data gravity uh, which is interesting of course is these days really important i talked about this accumulation right we also talked about the map reduce idea 
and this iteration that basically many of these applications are just very good in it if you read only or read often. When you come quickly to writing and migration and copying the data back and forth, here and there these solutions are really, you know, careful to consider. Uh, examples are if you have a terabyte, you know, MP3 collection, if you want to then migrate that in and out, this could be costly. You have seen the prices, right? For every API call, for every movement you pay in the cloud. It's not that they're just sitting there and then basically can be always accessed. For every access you have to pay. So there's a so-called migration cost, or as we say, you're locked in the data infrastructure you have. This could be considerations as a company, right? Think about big data and the amount of users, the databases were growing and growing and growing and growing. So, but of course now they are locked in this data infrastructure to really move all the users away. Now to let's say HD Azure suddenly means lots of migration costs. You have to have new services, people that understand these new services. And there are many other various ideas how basically you could think of, um, you should also choose, uh, which are perhaps a bit more company oriented or application specific, right? For some, it doesn't really matter because they maybe don't even have many data sets. They have just, let's say very smart algorithms, right? And they have minimalistic data or even open data. Then the migration cost might be very quick. So the data gravity doesn't matter anymore. But for them, maybe there's some other part that they can do essentially more data enrichments where already multiple data sets are already in the cloud provided that are open and public like statistics in US or some census data from cities and towns that, which are open and basically that are already provided. So that's why you maybe go to this cloud vendor because they offer that already on their storages. You don't have to pull it somewhere. And this is a modern trend as well called open data. We will have also a little bit more discussion about it in one of the subsequent lectures. So hence, it's actually not so easy to really choose the right model for the right company, right? Where you want to go, of course, start, um, I would always say very simple in the accumulation of all of these different cloud services, because once you have this really big architecture of using all of them, it can be inher inherently complicated to just move away to another one. And you will also see that, of course, it depends a bit like the developers, the administrators, the job portfolios you get. Let's say you're in AWS and you get a very good guy for deep learning, but he's used to use MS Azure, right? And this system. So there you would say, um, is it no something, is it realistic that he retrains everything on AWS? Or is that something for me not so important? He can still use Jupyter Notebook, but you know we have another guy in the company that actually provides him with the infrastructure with the Jupyter Notebook. These are all kind of interesting um, ideas how you really go now to the decisions of on-premise or on how far you go into the cloud services on these different levels. It's a bit of a conceptual topic, I know, just going a bit quicker now through it. Uh, again, this on-premise full custom is of course the most flexible option you can have. Um, very often used in very, very large companies that know their business and have, let's say, skills in-house that really know how to do how to do how to do deployments like that right that is what you basically do you install operate security updates in the operating system you install and update map reduce yourself you can do you know this all but of course you'd have to have the right people for it and of course to know how to build a data center facility that is in many cases for smaller companies or medium enterprises not scalable right so what happens if suddenly you need much more let's say capacity then when you have this appliance, um, we know already virtualization is a very good helper. And we know there's a strong community that has already lots of virtual machine images ready for Hadoop, for Spark, things you can actually very quickly deploy. So you actually more or less are more responsible providing a virtualized environment. Is this what we learned in lecture four, right? With a virtual hyper, with a hypervisor for virtualization. And then you can do basically and pull down the images from the community. And it's essentially uh, still the, the kind of hardware that you have to do and also the virtualization that you have to do, but you don't have to care so much about the configuration of these different ones anymore because they are provided by the community. It's not the full truth. You still have to know a lot of virtualization technology, a lot of you know the idea of having still the hardware at your site, but essentially you don't have to deal with all the different Hadoop installations anymore. This is kind of virtualized way. And of course, there you can really quickly starting to, to do some things. And 
we, here's now the important difference between the two MapReduce hosting and MapReduce as a service, just to get the idea that there is a difference, right? So when you think about here, that's more the idea that someone else is hosting MapReduce for you, like Elastic MapReduce, maybe it's there. And then there's an organization boundary in between and you use this like the Elastic MapReduce. So this is something where you agree to certain service level agreements and what could be quite attractive for an SME still maybe to think about then when they have, let's say the right level of users so that basically they deploy and operate a MapReduce cluster. And this is an example that we have seen. It's so quick and easy to do, right? When we use MS Asia, we had this template facility which was exactly this. There's a MapReduce then starting up, creating a cluster. All of this is like the AWS Elastic MapReduce, also in the Hardy Insight. Just a couple of clicks, you could go into these interesting templates and say, instead of two workers, I want to have 20 workers to do more. You pay for it. But essentially all this knowledge of how to really install these different things is abstracted away. So it's very nice. And of course, very much automated for us. When we now have MapReduce as a service, then basically you'd have uh, the whole kind of cluster is already so abstracted away that you just focus maybe on some, let's say, um, specific services to be used in that. So that you basically have, of course, something like Elastic MapReduce already with a suite on top that uses then it with machine learning. So here you don't even think about anymore the, the idea of doing the map and reduce system or the, the kind of implementation for this, you have it as a service. And with this can just ship their map and reduce implementations from different Apache stacks like Mahout or Spark has also with the ML lib, for instance, with machine learning lib, you just ship their map and reduce and it will work. And basically there you have, of course, a very high pricing ratio usually that you basically have to provide. And uh, still it's a facet way, of course, to use it but also the most inflexible way because essentially everything is installed and provided by the owner really, which is not, of course not anymore you, you just use it as a service. And you can always decide to cancel it, right? Because sometimes here in the other one, uh, you maybe have an agreement with someone else in a third party provider that is hosting MapReduce for you. And it's a contract maybe over 12 or 24 months because they also have to do the physical hardware and so on, but they service maybe different companies with a MapReduce cluster. Here, of course, you can simply say, I don't swipe my credit card anymore, bye. Also, of course, here and there very attractive, for instance, for companies that are just exploring these tools and these technologies. And we had the Elastic MapReduce as one example. Now, if you think about, this is of course a full complete solution but if you have, let's say, someone in between that has to offer all of this and let's say are maybe much more cheaper, the question is, can you go out of these contracts quickly? Um, the question is, could they be really scaling like Amazon? Um, maybe not. This is something, of course, also to consider. Right, so in a way that was really all I wanted to leave you on the table. Um, I just want to also make the case because we had Vern Global video. So I, of course I have to have an Advania video to be also here neutral in the course and with apologies that I don't have something from Borealis that will be coming in subsequent lectures. So now we're talking about um, Advania, which is very much known for the non-Icelanders here in the course. Um, this is one of the leading companies here for, for these services. There's Advania Tor data center, for instance, here as well. Nordic IT company, which offers diverse services and solutions in high performance computing. Advania offers the most cost-efficient and sustainable HPC hosting worldwide and HPC services paired with experienced team of HPC engineers. Our data centers in Iceland ensure great redundant connections to both North America and Europe and have a remarkable power efficiency performance with PUE as low as 1.03. Hosting your HPC cluster with Advania means that you have access to additional HPC resources on demand for temporary spikes in workload. Whether you are waiting for added hardware or have a temporary need for added CPU power, Advania's HPC services help you execute faster, saving time, resources, and money. Our HPC team is here to support your operations with everything from cluster architecture, procurement, and setup to monitoring, application support, and workflows. 
With Advania's HPC hosting or on-demand services, you are able to eliminate high upfront CAPEX, converting your HPC operations to pure OPEX. Our partners are leading HPC vendors that offer cutting edge HPC services and solutions. Founded in 1939, Advania serves over 10,000 public and private customers in Europe, ranging from small businesses to multinational enterprises. A diverse team of over 1,000 IT professionals ensures that your customers benefit from our strong competencies and capabilities. We work with our customers to deliver HPC efficiently and fast. For them, Advania means advantage. <laughs> Okay, just a short disclaimer as usual that I'm not paid by them and also not paid by the others. That's all for the lecture today. Remember, we have a quiz afterwards, which I just will basically make free now and I have to vanish for a PhD defense. So thank you very much. Good speed with the quiz.